get underway. So once again, welcome everyone to Berkshire Museum Family Trivia Night. I am your host, Peter. Uh, tonight's trivia is on bugs and planes, trains, and automobiles. Now, uh, due to the limitations of the webinar technology that I have, uh, unfortunately, this is a score at home trivia game. So uh, you, now is a great time to grab yourself a pen and some paper in order to keep track of your scores at home. Uh, there are 10 questions tonight, uh, all multiple choice, and uh, five on bugs, and five on our planes, trains, and automobiles. Now, uh, as always, I cannot see what you are doing, but I beg of you, please do not use the internet to cheat, even though it is very easy to do so, since I cannot enforce it in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so we work on the honor system. Please do not use the internet, uh, even though you are using the internet to visit me. Alrighty. Um, and as always, a recording of this trivia will be up on our website uh, if you ever want to replay it or watch it at a later date. Uh, they can be found on explore.berkshiremuseum.org, uh, which is home to all of our at-home materials, including worksheets, activities, and videos. Alrighty. So for tonight's Berkshire Museum trivia, our first question, I, I want you guys to close your eyes for a second and imagine you're, it's late summer, you're outside, and there's a lot of noise in the air. And once you remove the frogs and the birds, you're left with the insects. There are a number of different insects that all make noise, uh, from chirps to, uh, well, chirps, pretty much just chirping. Uh, <laughs> my question for you all, is which insect is the loudest so if you had to pick out of all the insects in the world which one is the loudest so which insect produces the loudest sound is it the cricket is it a type of bee is it the cicada or is it the katydid which bug is the loudest start you guys off with a nice Easy intro question. All righty. We got all of our answers in, so we're going to end our polling there. Share results. Pretty much all uh, cicada was the runaway victor there. Uh, and you guys are, of course, correct. Cicadas are the loudest insect. They produce a tremendous noise. Um, interesting thing about cicadas is uh, they emerge on various different cycles. So uh, different swarms will, uh, their larva will stay in the ground for different set periods of time. Some are seven years, some are like 20 years. There's one that's super long, I think like 40 or something years. And the larva will stay underground for that period of time only to emerge en masse altogether. And so there are cicadas that show up every year, and then there, there are these swarm cicadas which show up on these longer multiple year cycles. And when they emerge, it is usually a very loud summer as all of those cicadas climb onto a tree and just screech out into the night to try to find other cicadas to make more cicadas. All righty. So that is our loudest insect. But now we're going to focus on some more beautiful insects. Uh, this is, of course, a collection of different butterflies. Now, an interesting thing about bugs is while pigments make up a lot of the colors you see on butterflies and other insects, sometimes the colors aren't actually a pigment, which is to say, if you were to look at that wing or shell under a microscope, there'd be no color there. The color is actually coming from the structure and what light it reflects back. And so, and often these are iridescent colors. Um, so the iridescent blues and greens and golds uh, usually are not from a base pigment in the, in the skin, but actually the structure of the shell or wing that gives it that, uh, that bold color. So my question for you guys on number two is, uh, which one of these butterflies uh, color is a result of the structure of its wing scales as opposed to pigment? Uh, that is to say, which one of these butterflies 
gets its color not from the pigment in its in its wings, but rather the structure of the scales of the wings. Um, and so butterfly wings, if you look at them under microscopes, they're covered in these tiny little scales. And one of these butterflies, those scales are structured in su such a way that they reflect light back, giving us the sense that it is a particular color. Um, if you've ever been to either the Berkshire Museum or any museum that has an insect collection, uh, the bugs that have this structural color are the ones that still have that color even when they're preserved. So you notice a lot of butterflies fade um, when they've been, you know, on those little pins in a museum. Uh, butter, uh, butterflies that have this structural color stay that bright, vibrant color uh, years after they have been preserved. Ooh, this was a mix of results. Uh, it was a tie between the Viceroy and the Blue Morpho with the Blushing Phantom coming in third. As great as the Blushing Phantom's name is, uh, it is actually a clear-winged butterfly. So it has uh, basically window panes for wings. Uh, the Viceroy is a butterfly that mimics the colors of a different butterfly. Uh, in, in this case, the Monarch, which is how it gets its name. So the answer is... The blue morpho. The blue morpho is this butterfly that has this iridescent wing, and you can see it on this picture here. These preserved blue morphos, their wings still have that iridescent blue years after they were preserved because of that structure of the wing. So because that wing just reflects blue light, the, there's no pigment to fade, so it'll stay that remarkable blue well after the butterfly has died. In fact, scientists are studying these um, insect iridescence as a way to uh, deal with counterfeiting um, and putting it into money, that structural color as opposed to pigment color. All righty, my next question has to do with sort of a mystery. Uh, there are a lot of terms out there uh, for various individuals in the fields they study. For example, uh, you have historians. But, and archaeologists, but if you have an archaeologist that specializes in uh, Egypt, he's known as an Egyptologist. Uh, so there are those terms for insects as well. So my question for you guys is, what is an apiarist? It is a term that is specific to someone who does something with bugs. What is it? Is it someone who studies butterflies, someone who collects beetles, a person who keeps bees, or a person who breeds scorpions? So this is question three. I want you guys to think, what is an apiarist? Someone who studies butterflies, someone who collects beetles, is it a person who keeps bees, or is it a person who breeds scorpions? All right, we're going to wrap up our polling there. Uh, Taking the lead with your, with your guesses is a person who keeps bees, and you guys are 100% correct. A beekeeper, a fancier term for them, is an apiarist, and a fancier term for a beehive is an apiary. Uh, now, there is a special term for someone who studies and collects butterflies. Uh, they are known as a lepidopterist, uh, and the uh, this is taken from the Latin term for the butterfly's family, uh, which is lepi Lepidoptera. So all butterflies and moths belong to the uh, family of Lepidoptera, and those who collect them are Lepidopterists. And that is, a, that is a mouthful to say that many times. All right. And while they are not insects, they are still considered bugs, as that is a broader term for... Uh, Ex our exoskeletal friends. Uh, this is, of course, a jumping spider. Spiders are known for their eight legs and eight eyes, and I am terrified of them, and I spent a long time on the internet trying to find the cutest picture of a spider so I could look at it without feeling weird. Uh, so I went with jumping spiders because I feel they are the cutest, and you can see those large eyes there. Now, most spiders have eight eyes. My question is, do their close arachnid cousins, the scorpions, also have eight eyes? So it's a true or false question. Scorpions have eight eyes, like their spider cousins. Is this true or false? 
Scorpions have eight eyes like their spider cousins. They are closely related, but do they share the number of eyes? They share the number of legs. Do they share the number of eyes? All right, we've got all of our votes in. Pretty confident on this one, the lot of you guys. Uh, most of you said false, and you guys are correct. The majority, um, the majority of scorpions just have the two eyes. There are some blind cave scorpions and things like that, um, just as there's blind cave spiders. Uh, but the majority of scorpions just have two eyes, as opposed to the spiders, which have eight, which is just far too many. Uh, I have an entire spiel about why spiders are creepy and weird, but I will not share that with you tonight. All right, you guys. Our final bug question of the night uh, relates to uh, the sacred scorpion. This is actually, uh, not sacred scorpion, sacred scarab. Uh, now, in ancient Egypt, there is, uh, this scarab is seen in hieroglyphs. They would also make pendants of it. Uh, here are several of these uh, scarab pendants. And you can see they are inscribed with the names of different pharaohs of Egypt. So the sacred scarab was a very important image in ancient Egypt. My question is, for you guys is the actual sacred scarab, the living sacred scarab species, uh, lives on a diet of what? Is it a uh, dung beetle? Uh, living off of the uh, droppings of other animals? Does it live in the papyrus reeds that live along the shore of the uh, Nile, uh, eating the plants? Uh, does it live in date trees, eating uh, in date palms, eating the uh, fruits there? Or is it a type of water bug, uh, skimming the water for algae? So is it a dung beetle? Is it uh, gnawing on papyrus reeds? Uh, does it live on a diet of dates? Or is it a water beetle, and is it living on algae on the surface of the Nile. So this is a type of scarab that is very common in Egypt. Uh, its imagery is found on tombs and obelisks and uh, all sorts of ancient structures uh, made into rings and pendants. Uh, and what is its diet? We're going to give just a few more seconds on a guess there. Uh, of course, if you saw the historical documentary, The Mummy, uh, you would know that uh, scarabs are, of course, uh, capable of uh, turning someone into a skeleton in a matter of seconds uh, because they're like piranhas. Um, this is, of course, again, in the historical documentary uh, starring Brendan Fraser, The Mummy. All right, we're going to wrap it up there. Most of you uh, went with dung, uh, and you guys are correct. If you were to see these scarab beetles out in uh, the wild, out in Egypt, uh, they are in fact the ones that are kicking over around those big dung balls uh, with their back legs and scooting them up the dunes to bring them back to uh, where they would feast on them. So the sacred scarab of Egypt is a type of dung beetle. It's also very pretty looking. All righty. That wraps up our bug section of the polls. We are now moving on to planes, trains, and automobiles. And we are kicking it off with uh, trains. Now, this here is Union Station. It was the central train station in Pittsfield for a long time. Uh, this image here, you can actually see uh, we have some horse-drawn carriages, as well as early cars. Uh, for a long time, cars and horse-drawn carriages had to share the road. Now, uh, train stations like, Union's, uh, like Union Station not only served as the crossroads for passenger rails traveling in and out of the Berkshires, it was also a hub of the uh, trolley systems. Now, Trolleys would eventually become uh, electrically powered, as it was seen as the most efficient way to move them around cities without creating excess smoke 
smog and other uh, and other ways uh, and other things that would you know make people cough. Uh, so my question for you guys is, when was the first electric train introduced? What year was the first electric train introduced? Was it 1972, 1931, 1883, or all the way back in 1837? So what year do you think the first electric train was introduced? Now, there are a variety of different power sources uh, for trains. Uh, early on, you had steam-powered, which were usually coal-fueled, but other um, fossil fuels could be burned in those uh, boilers as well to generate the steam. Uh, and a lot of electrically powered trains still have sort of a diesel electric generator on board. So they basically have a power plant generating the electricity for the train. Uh, so it's more of a hybrid model on those, um, where it's not a diesel engine directly powering the wheels. It is a diesel engine creating electricity, which then powers the wheels. But you also have battery-operated trains, and you also have uh, trains like the Green Line and Subway Lines, uh, where they have a third rail or overhead line, which is providing power for the train. All right, all of your guesses are in. Uh, Squeaking out with the majority, uh, with the majority is uh, 1883. Uh, it will surprise you guys to know that it was actually 1837. Uh, a Scottish inventor in unveiled a electrically powered trolley in 1837, and in fact, this one was uh, not even a generator producing electricity to power the train. It had batteries as well, so it was a battery operated electrical train all the way back in 1837. Uh, so that is the very first electric train that was introduced. However, it took many, many decades for the de technology to reach a point where it was really commercially viable. Alrighty, here you see a um, early fire engine. Now this one is uh, I know it says that it is um, a, well, this is a self-propelled fire engine. Uh, it's not truly self-propelled. It does require still horse and buggy. It uh, just also slightly turns the wheels to make it a little easier on the horses. Uh, this particular model was constructed in the Amos Cake Manufacturing Company in Manchester, New Hampshire. Fun fact, uh, I used to work at, well, I interned in college at the, uh, that uh, at a museum that is now in that building. Um, so I have ties to Amiskeg. Uh, however, um, these horse-drawn fire engines would be replaced by motorized fire engines that would eventually become the fire trucks we are all familiar with today. Uh, my question for you guys is, uh, now Knox Automotive produced America's first motorized fire engines in what Massachusetts city? Uh, Knox Automotive was a Massachusetts-based uh, automotive company that took it upon themselves to build a motorized fire engine. Now, this uh, fire engine, uh, there had been motorized ones in Europe, so Knox Automotive had looked at the European uh, motorized fire engines and then brought the idea and started producing them here in Massachusetts. Did they do it in Boston, Worcester, Haverhill, or Springfield? Which Massachusetts City, did they produce these first motorized fire engines? Fire engines that did not need a team of horses to pull them. Uh, some say that these uh, fire engines are, in fact, the, uh, like the progenitor of all modern American fire engines. All right, just a few more seconds on those guesses. All righty, we're going to end our polling there. Uh, a bit spread out. Uh, a few said Boston. We have uh, one for Worcester. Um, we also have uh, in the lead is Springfield. And Springfield is absolutely correct. So there were a number of small automotive companies in Springfield uh, producing uh, both cars and industrial equipment. Uh, these would eventually be eaten up by larger companies and then move out of New England altogether. Uh, but in the early 1900s, uh, 
and there were a number of small manufacturers, and, it, and Knox, Knox Automotive was a manufacturer in Springfield that produced the first motorized fire engines in America. All right. Uh, in 2017, it was announced that the longest domestic flight in America uh, would be flying out of Boston. Uh, it is a trip from Logan Airport all the way uh, to Honolulu, uh, flying over 5,000 miles in one single trip. Uh, so if you are looking for a getaway, Logan Airport does have direct flights to Hawaii if you should ever need that information. Um, my question for you, though, is if you are making your Hawaiian escape, uh, how long is that flight going to be? So my question is, is approximately how long is the longest domestic flight in the U.S.? It is a flight from Boston to Honolulu. Is it 9 hours, 12 hours, 14 hours, or 16 hours? And this is approximate. Uh, wind speed will affect things a little bit. So uh, approximately how many hours do you think it will take to fly from Boston to Honolulu? And I can tell you right now, a flight from Boston to Baltimore takes about an hour, and a flight from Boston to L.A. takes a uh, very long time. And also, uh, you know, I kind of fell asleep. So I have no idea how long I was on that flight. So I can't help you there. That's useless information. <laughs> all right, we have all our guesses in. Uh, sort of all over the point uh, place. We have uh, uh, most... The plurality went with 12 hours, um, but we also have a few for 14 and 9 and 16. So you guys are a little all over the place on there because it's tough to guess. Uh, it is 12 hours. Uh, depending on which direction you're going, it's actually a little bit faster to go there. It's about 11.5 hours. Uh, the return flight is a little bit longer at just over 12, uh, just due to jet streams and things like that slowing down the plane. Uh, so if you are ever on your direct flight to Hawaii, uh, Strap in for a 12-hour flight. All righty. We've done trains. We've done planes. We've done fire engines. So now it is time to move on to cars. Over here, we have a beautiful Lamborghini. Uh, Lamborghini. Uh, now, this is a type of supercar, in case you're wondering what a supercar is. It is a car that goes ridiculously fast and costs an insane amount of money. And... Uh, it's typically a car you have to show off that you can afford this ridiculously fast car that you would then be afraid to drive on any road because you will scratch the paint or hit a pothole and dent something. Uh, but they are incredibly fast, incredibly beautiful cars. Now, a number of them have some strange names. So my question for you guys is, which one of these is not a real supercar? Which one of these is fake? Is it the Koenig, Koenigsegg Ejera, the Pagani Huara, the McLaren MP4-12C, or the Pegasi Tempesta? Which one of these is entirely fake? If I could remember the words to the uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Sesame Street, uh, one of these things is not like the other song. I would be singing it right now, but I do not. So I recommend that you sing that one at home. All right, so one of these cars is entirely fake. Uh, which one is it? All right, we've got all votes in. All right. The vast majority of you guys went with the Koenigsegg Ag Agera, Agera, I do not know. Uh, and we have one for the McLaren MP4-12C, which does sound like a serial number. Uh, the correct answer is the Pegasi Tempesta, which is actually from Grand Theft Auto V, an entirely made-up car. Uh, every other car on this list is an actual car that exists. 
Uh, Koenigsegg is a uh, German car company. Uh, Pagani are Italian. McLaren are British. McLaren also name all of their cars like they are printers. Uh, so just a series of numbers and letters. Um, the Pegasi Tempesta is a very fancy car you can get in Grand Theft Auto V. So not a real car. All right. Now we're going back to trains for our final question. Uh, here we have a lovely ad from General Motors advertising the train of tomorrow. Uh, before the creation of the automobile, trains were the best way to move people and goods around the country uh, uh, and still remain one of the best ways to move goods around the country. Uh, you find trains in every country in the world and uh, they have vast train networks all over the world. My question for you guys is, launching before I switched, uh, which country has the largest railway system? So if you were to add up all the miles of railway tracks, which country has the largest railway system? Is it India, China, the United States, or Germany? If you were to add up all the miles of track, including passenger and commercial rail, which country has the largest railway system? All right, a few more seconds on those guesses. Already, going to end our polling there. Uh, it was a hotly contested race between you guys uh, for India or China. Uh, India pulled out in the lead in your guesses. Um, so let's find out what the answer is. And it's the United States. So despite the fact that the U.S. has very limited passenger rail travel, its commercial rail network is absolutely enormous. So while India is famous for its uh, trains, um, uh, especially passenger rail, and China has been uh, building trains at, and railways at a record pace. Currently, the United States, or at least with the data I found, uh, ha still holds the lead for the largest railway network due to its absolutely enormous uh, commercial rail system. So we ship a lot of goods in the US over rail, and that is why the U.S. has that large lead. If you just look at passenger rails, U.S. is way down at the bottom because we have a very, very small passenger rail system. All right, you guys. That was the final question of the night. Thank you all so much for spending the night with me.